Good day. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to Rivian's third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. You will then hear an automatic message advising your hand is raised. Please note that today's conference is being recorded. I will now hand the conference over to your speaker host, Tim Bay, Vice President of Investigations. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Rivian's third quarter 2024 earnings call. Today, I'm joined by RJ Scaringe, our CEO and founder, Claire McDonough, our CFO, and Javier Varela, our Chief Operations Officer. Before we begin, matters discussed on this call, including comments and responses to questions, reflect management's views as of today. We will also be making statements related to our business, operations, and financial performance that may be considered forward-looking statements under federal securities laws. Such statements involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. These results and uncertainties are described in our SEC filings and today's shareholder letter. During this call, we will discuss both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures is provided in our shareholder letter. Just before the call, we published our shareholder letter, which includes an overview of our progress over the recent months. I encourage you to read it for additional details around some of the items we'll cover on today's call. With that, I'll turn the call over to RJ, who will begin with a few opening remarks. Thank you, Tim, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to start by talking about the R1 and specifically the Gen 2 ramp-up. First, the, the material cost uh, progress we've made, as well as the efficiency improvements within the plant, are really important and, and critical for our long-term profitability as a business. Uh, those changes and a lot of the changes that went into Gen 2 were, were focused on cost, but we also introduced hundreds of other design and engineering changes that enhance the performance of the customer experience in the vehicle. And one of those is, is the introduction of a new variant, uh, what we call our tri-motor. This puts a single motor in the front and two motors in the back, and it delivers really exceptional performance, performance that's better than our first-generation quad, but with a much lower cost uh, in terms of what it takes to manufacture it, and also with a substantial improvement to efficiency. And we're seeing a lot of excitement around the try, and, and we're excited to also be bringing the quad to market, the updated quad, uh, in, in 2025. Now with that, we had a bunch of suppliers who brought on with the Gen 2. Around 50% of the bill of materials by cost uh, is with new suppliers or with new contracts. And with that, there's been some challenges. And those have really impacted us in quarter. And this has been this has been a tough quarter for us because of some of those supply chain or uh, supplier ramp challenges. And and one of those suppliers in particular in particular has limited our production uh, quite substantially. And we're working very very hard to address that. This is uh, this is one of our highest priorities in terms of in terms of the business. And we're seeing this as really a short term issue, but it it certainly introduced uh, challenges as we saw in Q3. Now, a lot of the learnings that went into the, the Gen 2 ramp up, uh, the design of the components, the design of the systems, are underpinning what's going into R2. And the R2 program is, is advancing. Uh, it's, it's from a timing per point of view, it's on track. And the product itself is, is really exciting. It's <clears throat> delivering a level of performance and capability in a, in a package that really looks and feels like Rivian. Uh, but it's doing it at a, a substantial reduction in terms of its overall cost. And you know, a key part of this isn't just the design of the components. It's also all the supplier relationships that, that we've grown and built through R1. And today, as it stands, we've sourced about 85% of the bill of materials on, uh, on the R2 program. And that 85% that's been sourced is, is within our aggressive cost targets we've set for the program. And we've, we've talked about these at our investor day. But this is you know, overall going to be uh, what allows us to reduce the cost of R2 relative to R1 on a sort of a like-for-like -like basis in terms of content by about 45%. You know, beyond just the cost focus that's gone into R2, this is also a program that's, that's really been uh, architected around creating something that's special and unique in the marketplace. And our, really our, our key objective is to make sure 
we can capture the same level of market share and excitement that we've done with R1, where R1 is one of the strongest market share players uh, for vehicles, flagship vehicles, over $70,000. And our hope and, of course, what we're targeting is to uh, capture that same level of excitement but at a price point starting at $45,000 with R2. The key to delivering all this is, is the, of course, the launch of our plant um, and the production line here in Normal. And the expansions we're making to the facility are well underway. The grading work at the site level is, is essentially done. This positions us to start deliveries of R2 in the first half of 2026. And so that the progress that's being driven into the plant, the learnings from R1, and of course the supply chain uh, relationships we've established and the contracts we're putting in place are really critical for all, both delivering on the timing but also the aggressive cost targets we've set for this program. Now, we, we also announced today that the sourcing of uh, battery cells for the program, and we're using a cylindrical cell, a 4695 cell, so 46 millimeters in, in diameter, 95 millimeters tall. And that relationship with LG is something we've been working on for quite some time. And those cells go into a, a really uh, uniquely designed pack where the modules and the pack, in, in conjunction with, of course, holding the cells, uh, act as a core structural element of the vehicles. This is a structural battery pack where not just the, the structure of the pack is part of the body, um, but the top of the battery pack actually forms the floor of the vehicle. And so these are the types of decisions we're making across the R2 program to drive cost efficiency through part elimination or part consolidation, um, which is key for us delivering at the price point we've talked about with R2, but, but doing that with a healthy positive gross margin. Now, beyond body structure, battery sourcing, the vehicle architecture, some of the things we've talked about, one of the other really important elements of R2 is leveraging the electrical architecture, our topology VCUs, and the software stack we've developed, and put that into the Gen 2 of R1, uh, is that that platform underpins R2. It's also core for joint venture with Volkswagen. And uh, the, the joint venture with Volkswagen continues to progress well. We remain really excited about this. Your teams are, are, are passionate about the impact we can drive through leveraging and, and put, seeing our technology make its way into so many different vehicles. We have a, a drivable demonstrator where we've put our hardware and our software into a Volkswagen Group product. And the investments from Volkswagen as part of this joint venture, which, which we've talked about in the past, these are really important for us. These allow us to not only uh, fund the, the, the continued growth of Rivian and through the launch of R2 and Normal, but also allow us to launch uh, our production plant in Georgia where that will not only produce R2, but other vehicles on this mid-sized platform. And ultimately, the capital we have plus the capital provided by the joint venture will take us through uh, positive free cash flow. Now, I said it before, and I do want to end by just restating the importance of creating highly compelling product in driving the transition to electrification. You know, we've seen that with R1. Uh, the R1S is the, is the most popular SUV over $70,000 uh, in California, and that's not just the most popular electric SUV. It's the most popular SUV sold in California. Uh, we're hoping to see that level of excitement continue uh, and carry through with R2, as I said, and ultimately, that's what's going to help pull customers out of combustion vehicles, internal combustion vehicles, and NTVs, as the features and the capabilities of the vehicle being so exciting that it, it, it helps draw customers in. And so that's our focus. That's what has us uh, incredibly optimistic around the future. And we'd like to thank all those that continue to support this vision. You know, this is our employees, this is our customers, partners, suppliers, of course, our communities. Uh, and lastly, our shareholders. So with that, I'll pass the call to Claire. Thanks, RJ. During the third quarter of 2024, we made progress driving greater cost efficiency and validating the differentiated nature of our technology stack. During the third quarter, we produced 13,157 vehicles and delivered 10,018 vehicles, which represented the primary driver of the $874 million of revenue we generated. As mentioned on our second quarter earnings call, we expected Q3 deliveries to decrease on a sequential basis due to the reduced R1 inventory. 
We started the third quarter with low finished goods inventory of R1 due to the successful sell down of our first generation R1 vehicles in the second quarter. Demand for R1 vehicles was negatively impacted in the third quarter of 2024 by the production disruption and challenging consumer backdrop. The sequential production ramp following the plant retooling upgrade and the part shortage limited availability of specific R1 variants for sale in the third quarter. Total gross profit was negative $392 million. Our gross loss per vehicle delivered was approximately $39,100 which includes $18,600 of depreciation and amortization expense and $600 of stock-based compensation expense. In addition, we incurred approximately $3,700 per vehicle delivered in the quarter related to our cost of revenue efficiency initiatives, which we do not anticipate being part of our long-term normalized cost structure. The introduction of the second generation R1 platform combined with the commercial cost improvements and commodity tailwinds are expected to enable a 20% material cost reduction when comparing an R1 dual motor with large pack produced in Q1 2024 versus Q4 2024. Importantly, in the third quarter, we saw a meaningful reduction in our second generation R1 material costs as compared to our first generation. This is in line with our target, and we expect to see this continue into the fourth quarter. We remain focused on driving greater cost efficiency throughout the company and continue to see this result in lower operating expenses. Our GAAP operating expenses in the third quarter were $777 million, which is the lowest level we've had in three years and a reflection of the cost savings initiatives we've put in place. We are reaffirming our annual production guidance of 47,000 to 49,000 vehicles. We expect to increase our tri-motor and commercial van production and deliveries in the fourth quarter as those variants only require one enduro motor. I want to emphasize we believe this is a short-term obstacle. We are reaffirming our annual delivery outlook of low single-digit growth as compared to 2023 which reflects a range of 50,500 to 52,000 vehicles. We expect to have a modest gap gross profit in the fourth quarter of 2024. This is supported by three key drivers. First, revenue per unit is expected to increase, driven by an increase in non-vehicle revenues, such as regulatory credits, service, remarketing, software, and other services. We now expect to have a total of approximately $300 million of regulatory credit sales in 2024. We also expect to see an increase in the R1 average selling price as we improve our sales mix with more meaningful tri-motor sales in Q4. Secondly, as part of the transition to our second generation R1 vehicles, we are seeing an improvement in material costs due to the design changes, supplier commercial negotiations, and lower raw material costs. We also expect the increased mix of EDB sales in the fourth quarter will also help drive down our variable cost per unit delivered. Lastly, based on changes to the design of our vehicles, improvements in the manufacturing process and depreciation of our initial vehicle tooling, we expect to reduce our fixed cost per vehicle delivered in the fourth quarter. We also expect LCNRV and firm purchase commitment balances to continue to decline in the fourth quarter. The new technologies introduced into R1 were strategically designed to benefit R2 in the long term. In addition, uh, building the R2 in normal first allows us to best leverage our operations, leadership team, and existing manufacturing and logistics operations and overhead costs. Because of these benefits, in addition to the significant progress we've made sourcing R2, we anticipate R2 as having a much faster path to profitability as compared to R1. While we continue to make progress on R1 cost structure in the near term, our team is focused on addressing the component shortage impacting our ability to produce enduro motors. Due to the lack of fixed cost absorption associated with the lower 2024 volumes, we are revising guidance for our 2024 annual adjusted EBITDA to between $2.825 billion loss to a $2.875 billion loss. CAPEX guidance for 2024 is unchanged at $1.2 billion. 
Looking ahead, we are excited about the significant opportunity of our joint venture with Volkswagen Group. As RJ mentioned, the proceeds we anticipate receiving following the formation of the joint venture and certain milestones together with our $6.7 billion of cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments are expected to fund Rivian's capital roadmap for growth. With the ramp of R2 in normal and build out of R2 and additional variants in Georgia, taking Rivian to free cash flow positive. We are excited to share the cost savings potential, milestones, and other benefits upon closing, which we expect to happen this quarter. I wanted to again thank our team, partners, customers, suppliers, and shareholders for their tremendous support. With that, let me turn the call back over to the operator to open the line for Q&A. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, simply press star 1-1 again. In the consideration of time, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please stand by while we compile the q and roster. Now, first question coming from the line of Manuel Rosa with Wolf Research. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my first question is on the um, um, improvements in uh, the gross profit and you know implications for the unit economics on on R1. Um, uh, obviously, you expect a fairly meaningful amount of red credits in the fourth quarter, and then it's a modest gross profit. So I would assume. You know, without it, it's still you know somewhat unprofitable. But can you maybe comment on where you are in the path of improvement in unit economics? How should we think about it in terms of how much does a fourth quarter mean for how do we think about it for 2025, and and which other levers you have to keep improving it, please? Sure. Thanks, Emmanuel. As, as you noted, um, one of the the primary drivers of the improvement that we anticipate seeing in our gross profit as, as we drive to, to Q4 uh, positive gross profitability is, is the growth in revenue per unit. And so that's been driven by both the 300 million that, that I talked about in terms of regulatory credit sales that we anticipate achieving throughout the course of this year, um, as well as some of the improvements that we'll see in, in our average selling prices. As we translate that into 2025, as well as on a revenue per, per delivered unit, in 2025, we'll also be launching our quad motor offering as well. So that will also be a, a tailwind as we think about um, overall ASP increase uh, catalyst for the business as a whole. Um, so that'll be another driver as we think about the, the go forward progression. The next piece is, is we look at the, the variable cost per unit improvement. While we'll continue to see progress in our, our reduction in material costs from Q3 into Q4, We'll continue to see tailwinds as well as, as we work our way into 2025. Uh, we still have meaningful commodity cost improvements um, that are still yet to be achieved. And then we've seen and continue to see the R2 sourcing process as another tailwind for us as, as we look ahead uh, to continued improvements, especially from a commercial cost down standpoint uh, from a variable cost per unit. The, the last piece is as we look at overall uh, fixed cost per unit uh, dynamics. Uh, clearly, the, the reduction in our, our uh, production guidance for this year did have an, an impact on uh, the progress in, in this category in particular, but we've seen you know, additional operational efficiencies that, that we're driving uh, within our, our production plant uh, through the, the pivot to our, our Generation 2 R1 vehicles as a whole, and then we'll continue to see both in the fourth quarter and in 2025 a step down in our depreciation expenses on aggregate as, as well, uh, given we're now you know, three years into production and we've largely depreciated uh, the majority of our, our uh, initial tooling uh, from our, our starter production standpoint as, as well. Okay, that's a, a lot of great call. Just maybe my follow-up would be then, uh, based on all these factors, would you expect um, 2025 gross profit to, you know, so be positive. And can you give us some sort of uh, indication of how to think about reg credits for 2025? Sure. Our, our goal, may, you know, remains that we are, are trying to target a positive gross profit for 2025. Um, I will say that this is, we're operating today in a, a fluid environment. 
and we'll provide you know additional details on that outlook for um, for 2025 on our, our Q4 earnings call when we'll provide our more formalized guidance for, for the full year as a whole. As it pertains to, to regulatory credits, uh, we do have visibility into uh, future opportunities for the sale of our reg credits uh, into to next year uh, and would expect them to be you know, in line with uh, what, we've, what we've seen here for, for 2024 as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Adam Jonas with Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks, everybody. So you, you highlighted a challenging uh, consumer environment. Um, just wanted to drill in on that. Uh, can you remind us what percentage of your volume in the quarter is uh, pre-ordered versus sold out of a dealer inventory, and how is that changing? And um, I, I'd also be curious, given um, events of this week, what if you could remind us what portion of your sales are to customers who realize a full $7,500 tax credit, um, and what and also what uh, percentage of your sales are leased? Um, and can you confirm how Rivian is, you know, that Rivian is not taking any direct residual value exposure related to those leases? Thanks. Sure, Adam. As, as we think, maybe I'll take the, the second part of your question first on, on leasing. Overall lease penetration was 42% within the quarter. Uh, Chase is our lease partner, and Rivian, together with Chase, uh, shares in the residual values of, of the vehicles that we have as part of that leasing program. And it's something we utilize, you know, third parties to, to mark the residual values um, that we anticipate achieving. And it, it's something that our team, you know, studies uh, carefully on a, you know, monthly and quarterly basis as, as we adjust our, our reserve levels um, accordingly to, to what we're seeing in the, the broader market backdrop as a whole. As we think about the, the overall mix um, of volume from pre-orders, in Q3, we had the end of our early pre-order pricing volumes as a whole. Uh, so we did see an uptick overall in terms of uh, consumers that were those early customers that were uh, utilizing that early uh, lower pricing uh, to their, their benefit as they you know, purchased a, a Gen 1 or, or the remainder of, of Gen 1 vehicles um, as a whole in, um, in Q3. And then in terms of the, the percentage of sales that, that receives the $7,500 credit, um, it's largely our uh, population of, of lease consumers that, that are able to take advantage of that credit, given the, the price point of our vehicles and the overall income levels. Most of our, our customers don't qualify on a, a financed or, or cash purchase. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Dan Levy with Barclays. Your line is now open. Hi, good, good evening. Thank you for uh, taking the question. I want to start and just follow up maybe a bit on uh, Emmanuel's question. And just to, to decompose the, three, the third quarter COGS per unit, I, you know, it was roughly $127,000 if you backed out the cost of revenue initiatives. Uh, but recognizing that there's, um, you know, there were inefficiencies on the volume, on, on the supplier side, Maybe what is a, a more clean way to look at your current COGS per unit? And then into 2025, you know, if you could maybe just decompose some of the pieces on the COGS per unit that get better, and specifically the cadence of material cost benefits, you know, how that layers in. Thanks, Dan, for the question. Yeah, this is, of course, something we, we spend a tremendous amount of time focusing on. And, um, you know, the third, third quarter was, it's a hard quarter to look through all the noise with the ramp up uh, and bring up of our Gen 2 platform. As, as Claire said, a number of supplier relationships that you know either changed or were ended and replaced with new supplier relationships. As I said, we replaced about 50% of the bill of materials uh, as measured by cost. And then of course the supply interruption that, that did halt production um, for some time and, and overall lowered the amount of vehicles we were able to produce in a quarter had some impacts. Uh, so you look through all that noise, and I think the important thing to note is if you were to look at material cost in this quarter in Q4, and you were to compare that to our material cost in the vehicle in Q1 of this year, uh, the Q4 material cost is gonna be 20%, we project to be 20% lower than what we saw in Q1. So we're making 
real meaningful progress in terms of lowering our bill of materials, lowering our cost structure. And in a similar fashion, we're also driving efficiency into how we're running the plant. So the hours per unit uh, that we build is coming down. Uh, we're driving more quality into the vehicles. So, so there's uh, you know, the, the, just the flow of the plant is running smoother. But it's really hard to see through all the different elements that made up Q3. And so we, 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 we actually talked about this a lot. How do, we, how do we communicate the progress we're making despite the fact that Q3 makes it hard to see? And I think, you know, in short, that one of the most important things to, to call out here is that we're continuing to guide on, on Q4 uh, to a positive gross margin overall. With that said, I do want to just uh, invite Javier to have a few comments here. He's, he's joined the team um, now for a couple of months. He's, him and I, and along with the rest of the leadership team, have been working really closely together, not just on the production of R1 and the continued progress towards positive margin there, but, but very importantly on the R2 program and that's both in terms of the plant, but also the supply chain. Uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, indeed, uh, it's a big focus uh, currently is in improving performance, uh, implementing uh, lean acceleration, if I may call it that way, compressing the value streams, uh, empowering the shop, so unleashing the potential of all of our uh, members, uh, team leaders, group leaders. Uh, and we have started recently with a, a very promising results and really was visiting the line uh, this morning and I'm very pleased to see how people are engaged in, in improving performance. We are as well uh, robustifying our Rivian uh, industrial operating system uh, or integrated operating system, all our lean principles and again accelerating their implementation and uh, when it comes to the way of working uh, in, in the teams enhancing an end-to-end cross-functional view and, and collaboration. The, 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 the big priorities uh, uh, for, for that performance is improving in the short term that, uh, that those results, but what's more important is to prepare uh, the, 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 the plant for landing uh, R2 uh, appropriately uh, at the right levels of quality, cost, and, and with the right delivery times. Great. Uh, that's, that's helpful. And maybe just you, you could, if you could remind us on the, you know, the benefits actually from stronger operations in, in 25, you know, how much runway there is to, to drive the COGS per unit down. Sure. As, as we think about 2025, one of the core benefits that we'll have is having the Gen 2 in production for the entirety of the year. Uh, relative to, to what we had over the course of, of 2024. Um, as, as RJ alluded to, 2024 is also a little bit noisy, just given uh, the shutdown that we had to, to introduce the, the Gen 2 into the line and, and ramp up uh, from our production standpoint. So as, as we look ahead, uh, Javier and, and team, you know, now have the opportunity to, to really drive many of those core lean manufacturing principles uh, to drive an overall focus around operational efficiency, within our, our manufacturing facility here in, in normal um, and, and ensure we're ready for R2, which is, is coming next in, in 2026. We will still have a, a shutdown um, as, as part of our production cadence in, in 2025. Uh, that'll be in the second half of the year, of, of just over a, a month of, of shutdown there uh, to, to do a, a number of uh, work and a lot of work on many of the shared shops um, and specifically our, our paint shop to make sure that we're ready for our two's uh, starter production. Thank you. If, if I could just squeeze in one more on, on Volkswagen, you know, we've seen the Scout announcement, and it's using uh, the the joint electrical architecture. Maybe you could just, and I know we're waiting for the JV to be closed, but remind us of sort of where the collaboration currently stands. Yeah, as I said, we're excited about our partnership with Volkswagen and um, uh, looking forward to being able to support developing really compelling products across, you know, across a portfolio of brands and, and markets. Uh, as it stands today, we've, we've built uh, a demonstrator essentially that, that is a driving vehicle that utilizes our electrical architecture, our ECU topology, our software stack. Uh, and it's incredibly encouraging and exciting to our teams on, on both the Rivian side and the Volkswagen Group side. And um, 
you know, the, in terms of which products our technology is going to go into and in what cadence that's not been announced yet. Uh, but of course, the nature of the deal and the scale of this partnership in this deal uh, is such that our technology be seen across many different products and brands within the Volkswagen Group family. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Mark Delaney with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Yes, um, good afternoon. Thanks very much for taking my question. Uh, I think 2024 20, production guidance implies that production in the fourth quarter will be a little over 11,000 units or roughly 865 uh, vehicles per week. Maybe you can help us better understand where Rivian currently stands. And I ask uh, to, to better contextualize where you stand with uh, the supply constraint with the Enduro motor. Uh, thank you, Mark, for for your question. Um, we are um, working. Uh, we have been working in the last weeks with that uh, specific uh, constraint. I would say that it's a short-term constraint, and uh, the teams have demonstrated a great, enormous sense of urgency. Um, gathering together with the supplier, uh, working cross-functionally, constrained teams on 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 uh, on site. And uh, what's more important is that we, we are now ramping up a new capacity in record time. The last weeks uh, are very, have been very promising, and uh, we see that uh, we are in, a, in the right trend to recover the, the right capacity. Um, really, really promising. So uh, we, we think that uh, that problem, oh, I think, really think that that problem will be over in the very next weeks. So. Thank you for that color. Uh, my second question was around the regulatory credits. Uh, Claire, you said you now expect 300 million for this year. I, I had thought it was closer to 200 million uh, as, as an outlook for 2024. Maybe help us better understand what's leading to the upside uh, relative to the prior view. Thank you. Sure, Mark. As, as we've gone throughout the, the course of, of this year, we, we have seen an increase in the underlying value of the regulatory credits that we've been selling to, to many of the OEM counterparties across the board, um, as well as the opportunity to, to sell uh, deeper into the, the overall um, red credit areas of, of focus for our, our core team. Um, this is a highly complex uh, you know, puzzle as, as our team you know, manages our credit portfolio relative to the needs of, of other OEMs on a you know, state by state you know, basis as a whole. And so this is just a demonstration of, of the progress that our team has been able to make uh, to achieve, you know, this great outcome of, of being able to bring in $300 million of, of value to Rivian through the sale of, of these regulatory credits. Thank you. Our next question coming from the line of Joseph Speck with UBS. The line is now open. Um, thank you very much. Um, Claire, um, you know, just in talking about 2025 a little bit, uh, a couple times on this call, and you, you mentioned still that gross, part, gross profit positive target. Um, you, again, just sort of mentioned, um, you know, some downtime um, uh, later, in, later in the year. So I, I just, just to be clear, when you say gross profit positive, is, is that for the full year at some point of the year? Is it like on the R1 vehicle, like X something for R2? And I guess just related to uh, the regulatory credit question, like how do we think about the cadence of that? Like, do you have any recourse and when do you recognize that revenue? Sure, Joe, as, as we look at 2025 overall, as, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we will have quarterly impact. So it, it, we don't expect that every quarter in 2025 will be positive gross profit in its own right. Um, our target is to be positive for the year in its in it, is it in its entirety and so as we think about some of the the relative impacts that that we'll have you know next year as a whole um some of that will be driven by the lumpiness of the recognition of our regulatory credits as well that that are certainly an enabler of that path to, to positive gross profit in 2025 in aggregate and so as, as we look out in, into the future, you know, we do have an understanding of, of timing needs of, of many of the counterparties that we're working with. Um, in some cases, the, the timing of regulatory credit recognition is related to government agencies as well. Um, so some of it is, is a little bit up for, uh, you know, understanding the exact, you know, timelines that will achieve it. 
but that's you know our, our current view and as we think about the the overall cadence of uh, recognition of those credits. But just at a at a high level, excluding maybe some of the um, agency stuff, like it, you recognize revenue when it, someone tech buys it from you. Like you can't recognize you can't recognize it on an agreement to buy it from you. Right. It's not on an agreement. It's when we transfer the credits to that counterparty. Okay. Um, the second question, just um, I, I apologize, I, I, I joined a little late, right, as you were saying this, but I thought I heard you say van production will be up uh, in the fourth quarter. Is that deliveries too, or are you building some inventory maybe in advance of some actions in next year? Because I thought in the past you had mentioned that Amazon doesn't really like to take a lot of vans in the fourth quarter. So did something change with the, um, the cadence there? Yeah, as, as I mentioned um, in my prepared remarks, we, we're increasing our production of you know both vans as well as trimotors in the fourth quarter. Um, so increasing production as well as deliveries of, of those units, because both of those uh, variants only require one enduro motor. And so from an operational efficiency standpoint, um, that was the the best way for us to to increase or maximize our overall production for the the year in in aggregate. Um, so. Uh, I would say we do certainly expect that there would be, you know, additional Amazon van sales uh, in the fourth quarter of, of this year. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Georgian Enriquez with Can Opportunity. Elon is open. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for taking my questions. I just want to uh, piggyback on a previous question around the relationship with Volkswagen and the Scout vehicle. And from, from what we understood about the, the relationship. It, it, it had to do with electrical and software, but the car looks a lot like an R1. And, and so to what extent can we expect there to be sort of a, a, a similar lineup from Volkswagen with regard to, to Rivian and, and how closely will you be cooperating on aesthetics as well as engineering? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, George. The, the joint venture, uh, what it encapsulates is uh, electrical architecture, our ECUs, and our, the software that's running on those ECUs. And uh, it's really important to, to recognize that that doesn't mean the UI frameworks, the way the digital screens inside the vehicle look, the number of screens, the shape of the screens, but really the underlying software. Um, and that's going to, you know, that platform, our platform is going to be used across a wide range of products and brands. And each of those products and brands will have decisions around what the vehicle itself looks like, which of course doesn't link to the software, to the electronics, but they'll also have decisions around what the UI looks like inside the vehicle and in their overall digital design and de design framework. Uh, so, you know, with regards to uh, our role in any design decisions, those decisions remain with the brands, of course, within Volkswagen Group. Thank you. And maybe as a as a follow up, just any update on on commercial vehicle traction in the marketplace and when we could expect additional customers to ramp uh, volumes. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, we've said um, for for a while now the the, the sales cycle on on these larger corporate uh, uh, commercial fleets. Uh, take some time. Uh, you know, it's not just the purchase of the vehicles or the decision around vehicles, but it's it often means changes to the standard operating procedure for the fleet operator. Uh, it requires charging infrastructure, uh, which often is is not simple uh, because the sites that they're operating out of may not have been designed for uh, that level of that level of power, that level of energy. And so, with that said, we are uh, starting to see. The beginnings of the efforts that we've had over the last year to put those in place and, and we'll start to see more of that in 2025 and this is a focus for the team and we're super excited about seeing our vans out in the world with uh, different logos and different brands on them as, as different fleets start to start their journey towards electrification thank you and our next question coming from the line of Tom Narian with RBC Capital. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking the question. Um, sorry, one more on regulatory credits. So if I 
if I look at the Q3 gross profit at the negative 392, um, I believe the, the 300 million of that, I think 275, it's in Q4 alone. Uh, I think you did 25 year to date. Um, so that would imply like 117 million benefit in Q4. Volumes were depressed in Q3, so uh, you know they're coming back in Q4. That should be a, a benefit, a, a, a piece, a big piece. I would think of that 117. It, it just feels like the sequential bridge between Q3 to Q4 on cost improvement sequentially might not be as significant. It'd just be helpful, Claire, to just see what the cost improvement piece of that bridge is, if, if you could quantify that, that'd be really helpful. Thanks. Sure, Tom. We don't give um, specifics, but as we think about the, the core drivers beyond uh, the, the revenue-related ones that, that we talked about, um, there is going to be you know, significant improvement in, in underlying average selling prices as we um, start to sell through additional tri-motors in the quarter, uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, previously as well. Uh, we ended the you know pre-order holder price, early pricing, and so that would be a, a natural boost overall as we think about more full uh, full price sales in the fourth quarter in aggregate. And then as we look at the the underlying cost structure as a whole, um, in, embedded in our production guidance is uh, slightly below our Q3 level as we think about uh, the underlying fixed cost absorption. So where we're seeing the benefits there as I mentioned, are, are really a step down in depreciation. We'll also, we also expect to see our LCNRV and firm purchase commitment levels uh, coming down, and then we'll see continued progress on a, a variable cost per unit basis. So as, as RJ highlighted uh, previously as well, there's a, a bit of noise that you see in the Q3 numbers. So Q4 will be more, representat more representative of our go forward, you know, launching off point into to 2025, where we ex anticipate seeing, you know, further progress uh, across, you know, each of the, the three core drivers of uh, revenue per unit, variable cost per unit, and fixed cost per unit improvements. Got it. And my follow up, uh, RJ, on the uh, R2, I, I believe the, the $45,000 price uh, variety is the one that's not the 300 mile range one, it might be below. You know, just wondering how competitive that would be. Uh, you know, uh, a forty-five thousand dollar under three hundred mile range vehicle with the in twenty twenty-six. The competitive environment seems to be. You know, we have GM with the you know Equinox, the sub thirty thousand with three hundred plus miles of range. How does that compete? Is it a different demographic, perhaps, um, that, that makes it you know different features beyond just battery range? Just love to hear how. The competitive um, environment, you know, shakes out with, with that with that product at that range at that price. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tom, for the question on on R two. We we love talking about R two. We're we're super excited about it. Just to clarify, the 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 forty five thousand dollars starting price for R two corresponds to a, the a lower performance spec on the vehicle relative to what's possible at a platform level, but the range on that variant uh, is still. Uh, over 300 miles, so it's a 300 mile, it's a what we say 300 plus miles of range, but on a lower performance spec and with some of the content levels on the interior slightly different than the top spec variants. And you know we've spent a lot of time looking at this relative to what else is in the market, and one of the biggest unlocks we believe for overall demand of EVs and and you know the path towards ultimately 100% of new vehicle sales being electric is the need for a lot of customer choice and a lot more choice than we have today. And there are very, very few compelling options in that sub $50,000 price range. And, um, you know, I th we, we believe R2 is going to be an important product for giving customers choice. That's a unique form factor, uh, unique performance and, and, uh, brand and product attributes. And um, having spent you know, time, a lot of time in and around the vehicle, uh, I can say I've, I've never been as excited as I am for a product as I am for R2. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Jigsaw with BNP Paribas. Phelan is now open. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, on the revenue per unit increase for the fourth quarter, I, I assume this 
exclusive 275 million in, in regulatory credits. Is the, the increase a, a year over year reference or, or compared to the first quarter, if you just remind us? And then uh, just to echo, you know, maybe part of Adam's first question, what's the level of, of visibility in your order book for such a sizable ASP step up? And, and would the increase in EDV deliveries for the fourth quarter, you know, weigh on your ASP? So if you could help to mention what that EDV growth is, um, you know, might look like and you know, whether sequentially or year view, that'd be great as well. Thanks. Sure, as, as we think about the, the revenue per unit increase in, in the fourth quarter, um, as you rightfully called out, we, we see an increase in R1's uh, average selling price, which is partially offset by uh, an increase in the, the sale of, of commercial vans in the fourth quarter. Um, those comments were relative to what we experienced in the third quarter of, of this year as a whole. Um, as, and I would say as we look you know, back to, to last year in, in aggregate, uh, in Q4, you did see a, a much lower, you know, sort of 8% of revenue being represented by commercial vans. Uh, we'll see that just over, you know, about closer to the 25% level in Q4 of, of this year in, in aggregate. So there will certainly be some some puts and takes there, uh, but that's really the, the foundational drivers as we think about overall ASP, but on an, a blended average unit, we'll still see um, relative to Q3 and, and increase from an average selling price uh, standpoint. Got it. Super helpful. And then uh, just then, on the, for the – go ahead. Do you have anything else to say? No, I, I was just going to comment a little bit on order bank uh, or order book visibility as a whole. Um, our, our teams uh, from a go-to-market standpoint are, you know, continuing to drive um, – and, and push for you know more consumers to get behind the wheel of our, our vehicles. Uh, we saw that demonstrated by the 20% increase in our demo drives that we had in, in Q3 relative to, to Q2 levels, and uh, we're, we're continuing to drive you know brand awareness as a whole uh, to build up um, more and more interest in, in Rivian and and um, have those uh, that interest translate into to orders. Thank you. And then just on the VU uh, JV, it's, is it expected to close before your end? My apologies if I if I miss you know, confirmation or, or clarity on that. And just associated with the JV, uh, I believe there were going to be certain milestone achievements uh, associated with VW's additional funding tranches. So can, can you provide any any color at all on just what the context of those milestones might entail? Thanks. Hi, Jake. Um, you know, the Volkswagen joint venture you know, is uh, we expect it to fully close uh, certainly before the end of Q4. And, you know, a lot of the work that's gone into defining such a, you know, significant and scaled partnership is, is played out over the last few months. And part of that is uh, some of the, the KPIs, if you will, of the, the targets that we're setting for ourselves. And so we've worked really closely with the team at the uh, Volkswagen Group to define those, and we're very comfortable with those in terms of milestones that uh, unlock certain portions of the financing associated with the deal. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Edison Yu with Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, this is Winnie Dong on for Edison. Um, you guys have mentioned that you know 85% of the sourcing of all two bomb um, is already done. Um, could the potential tear off that you know take place under the administration play a role in in the cost target, or have you sort of designed the sourcing such that it you know wouldn't matter which administration wins the election this past week? The, it, you know, the 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 R2 sourcing process is something we've uh, looked at very strategically and certainly have contemplated even prior to the election, just what the impact would be uh, should the you know should the overall approach to tariffs change, and so a lot of uh, our focus has been on sourcing suppliers that are uh, not going to be subject to. You know, large tariffs and, and in places where we have source suppliers that are overseas that could be subject to, to changes in tariff structure. Uh, 
designed the contracts and designed the relationships in such a way that we're not carrying uh, much of the risk. Now, with that said, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of policy elements here that are in play and we're watching it very closely. I think what's going to be interesting is, is how far this reaches into the upstream supply chain. So as we think about raw materials, uh, and that's, you know, that's something that, you know, every manufacturer, certainly ourselves included, are, are thinking about. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, and then I think in, in Q3, we did see sort of like a, a meaningful decline in OPEX um, sequentially. Um, can you remind us if um, there was any any sort of extra reductions that flew through versus initial expectation and then, you know, how sustainable that is and how we should be thinking about that um, for 2025? Sure, as, as we think about the, the underlying reductions that we've seen in our, our cash operating expenses, um, we, we were able to, to bring that level to about $599 million for, for Q3, which is a, a significant step down from, from where we were in the first half of the year. Uh, we've, we've talked about the second half as being lower than the first half in, in aggregate, uh, which will unlock in our ability to be able to have lower cash operating expenses in 2024 relative to uh, what we had in, in 2023. And this is the collective efforts of, of many members of the Rivian team across the company uh, continuing to focus on, on driving efficiency so that we can strategically invest in the most uh, critical areas of the business as we think about uh, many of our differentiated technology investments, as we think about the continued rollout of our uh, service centers and spaces to support our, our go-to-market efforts and strategy. And, and so very much proud of, of the work that our, our team has done uh, to enable uh, this level of, of improvement. We do expect as we look to, to Q4 that we will see a, an uptick in, in terms of our spend. Um, that's really driven by additional R2-related spend that we'll begin to see from an R&D standpoint, and then the ongoing build-out of our, our go-to-market strategy, which will have um, you know, li some limited growth in our SG&A line as well. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Alex Potter with Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. Perfect. Thanks. <clears throat> so I had a question on uh, the Volkswagen relationship. There's obviously been, I don't know, a fair amount of intrigue in the media regarding headcount reductions and restructuring and plant closures and things going on at Volkswagen. And I just wanted to I guess, get some clarity on whether any of the teams that you've been working with may or may not be impacted. I don't know, obviously, you maybe can't put words in their mouth, but has this uh, impacted you in any way or are there ways that it could potentially impact you, um, you know, looking, looking ahead? Alex, uh, thanks for the question. The, the nature of what we're building uh, with our Volkswagen relationship and, and the partnership that's been designed provides a, a really efficient way for, for them to deploy advanced technology. So it's a, a zonal architecture, which you know, brings massive consolidation uh, to the ECU topology, uh, dramatically simplifies the, the, not only the software architecture, but also the electrical architecture as it pertains to the vehicle harness as well. So ultimately, this is, uh, just as it is within Rivian, this is going to drive structural cost advantages uh, into the business. And, um, you know, this is, I think, a core reason as to why this, this partnership and this deal has happened. So I think in the context of driving greater efficiency into, into their business, uh, what we're building with, with the joint venture absolutely aligns with that and is really important for not only creating products that are really compelling to customers, but to to create those products in, in, in ways that are uh, highly cost efficient. Okay, very good. Um, and then maybe uh, lastly, uh, there was a fair amount of verbiage in the shareholder letter on uh, Connect Plus um, streaming apps and things of this nature. Uh, is this, I mean, it sounds sort of compelling. It sounds like the take rates are pretty high amongst people who have been trying it. Is this something that you know, is modelable, something that investors should be uh, including in their own forecasting, or is, uh, you know, is it not quite material enough to call that out? Thanks. Yeah, 
Yeah, this is uh, this is sort of the, one of the big questions I think being asked broadly around uh, the automotive industry is, you know, to what level do future services show up as recurring revenue, or do they show up first, you know, price on the front end? And you know, in this case, the the Connect Plus, what that's you know, that's relating to is that there is a variable cost associated with providing the surface services. So the data costs uh, to, let's say, stream music or to um, have a Wi-Fi hotspot are, are non-zero. And so this reflects us capturing that uh, in, in a bundled package that brings along with it not just the, the, the price that covers the cost for us to be providing the connectivity, but also some additional features and you know, we're watching this very closely, and, and in particular, thinking about it in the context of the the growth of our autonomous platform and what that provides in terms of new features, new capabilities, and, and how to appropriately charge for that. And I, I think it's too early to tell uh, for us as an industry to say whether customers are going to prefer to pay for things up front uh, or whether they'll pay, you know like to pay for them over time. And you know, the way we've at least modeled it internally is we've looked at yeah, the the likely existence of both models, where you'll have some customers that would prefer to pay up front, and others that would rather pay on a more variableized basis. Um, and and you know, we we sort of look at it with some indifference, meaning is ultimately it it's going to get captured in the price of the vehicle, but it it can be captured in in a multitude of different ways. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question coming from the line of Mike Sliske with DA Davidson. Your line is now open. Uh, yes, hi. Thanks for taking my uh, question. Um, I guess given some of the challenges you mentioned, uh, the consumer challenges you had mentioned earlier, just with some of the demand uh, impact that that's been having, um, I've heard about these kind of new variants that might have higher price, and you've got a, a higher price assumption in the fourth quarter. But I'm curious if, if you're seeing on a like-for-like -like basis when people are making orders, are they trying to look at uh, cheaper options or maybe fewer features? Um, has that been a trend at all? It's important to recognize there's a, a really a broad spectrum of, of customers. And um, because of that, we've launched now three different powertrain configurations. So we have a dual motor, a tri-motor, uh, and in 2025, we'll be launching our updates to the quad motor. And then we have a couple of different battery pack sizes. We have a standard of, of large and what we call our max pack. And the, effectively, that's us trying to populate the demand curve where we know some customers have a, a want you know the best thing they can possibly buy. So they're willing to pay to get the two and a half seconds, zero to 60 and 400 miles of range. And others are going to be more price sensitive. I think what, what Claire's referring to and what we're excited about is just the level of customer excitement we're seeing for, for the tri and for our quad. And that, of course, is, is positive for us from a margin point of view. But these are hard things, you know, you can imagine we, we tried to model this, predict this, and these are hard things to, to, to accurately, accurately predict uh, and to now have the tri in the market and to see how customers are reacting to it, see the, you know, when we put a tri motor variant into our shop how quickly uh you know it's, it's there for you know but a moment it disappears very quickly that the level of excitement and demand for the, for that vehicle is high and so thinking or looking into 2025 the our next generation quad motor vehicle is really i mean it's just exceptional it's uh the first gen quad was great but this is a whole nother level it's you know it's a vehicle that can do the quarter mile in less than 10 and a half seconds it's incredibly smooth and refined it can go into almost any imaginable off-road environment, um, and you can use it as an everyday driver uh, while in conserve mode getting close to 400 miles of range. So it's just a very unique combination of attributes, and of course, uh, it'll be priced as such and, and therefore drive a you know, healthy margin to the business. So these are um, this is the reason we have this different uh, topology of, of motor, battery combination, and trim combinations to, to allow us to, to sell into multiple different customer types. Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions. I will now turn the call back over to RJ Scourge for any closing remarks. 
thanks everybody for joining us on the call today. As, as you heard me say in our opening remarks, uh, this is a challenging quarter with some of the uh, production uh, interruptions we had around supply and, and some of the uh, nuanced complexities associated with, with transitioning into the Gen 2 vehicle and ramping our Gen 2 R1. But we are incredibly excited about what lies ahead, uh, not just with Q4, but thinking uh, into 2025 and very importantly into 2026. Uh, the excitement around the R2 program, uh, both internally and externally, but, but from customers, but also just with the teams that are developing uh, the product and preparing it for launch is, is contagious internally, and, and every time I'm in or around it, I, I think to myself, I wish this was available today. Uh, so we are uh, fully embodying that and doing everything we can to get that vehicle to market, both uh, on time, but as, as Javier said, also really excited about how we're maintaining uh, the program around its cost targets, which is such a, a significant uh, focus for us with that program. And with that, it's exciting to have Javier join us on this call today. He's been uh, a great partner to, to me as we're continuing to build Rivian for the next stage of growth and, and really focus on preparing ourselves for a significant ramp up in volume with R2 and along with that uh, considerably lower cost to produce our vehicles. So with that, thanks everyone for joining the call and, and look forward to our next one. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude our conference for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.